Well, what's up, Mission? Great to see you guys uh, th this weekend. Man, we are in the beginning of summer. I mean, I, I love uh, summer. And I, I don't know whether you're doing vacation type stuff at all this summer, heading to the beach, the mountains, or where, wherever you can. It's been kind of a trying uh, few months in, in, in our country, in our world. And so some of you, if you can get away and get, uh, do a little different routine, it's probably you're really looking forward to that. One of the things I remember a lot about summer is I was a, I was a student ministry guy for a lot of, a lot of years. And I would take, uh, I'd take high school and junior high kids on these camps in the summer. We used to be able to do these things called camps. In the, in the summer, and uh, I remember one time going to a going to a camp. We we're going to take a canoe trip down a river, and this guy was explaining to all of us the uh, the safety uh, protocol for getting in the canoe because he, he knew a bunch of kids that never been in a canoe before, and how the, how to use your life jacket, what happens if water comes over the side, and your canoe gets swamped, how to turn it back over, all that all that kind of stuff. And he gave us all the safety gave us the safety talk. And then he looked at all these students. I'll never forget this. Even even wrote it in the margin of my Bible. Uh, he, he said, "You know what? Uh, I, I've been canoeing all my life. I'm I've been expert kayaker." And he goes, "I'll just let you guys know something. Most everybody like you're going to do today, we're just going to get in the river and you're just going to go with the flow. And if you eventually just continue to go with the flow, you end up like in the Gulf with with everybody else is just kind of going with the flow." He goes, "But from my years of kayaking and canoeing." Um, I know that the best way to do it is to turn your canoe around and go upstream. He goes, because when you go upstream, wildlife is not expecting anybody to be coming upstream. So you get to see things that most people don't get to see. And if, and if you keep paddling, you're going to end up not at the Gulf, but you're going to end up at the source of all the fresh water. And then he looked at all these, these students. I'll never forget this. He looked at them and he goes, the reason I'm telling you this is because you, you need to turn your life around and paddle upstream. Don't just go with the flow with everybody for the rest of your life. Just turn your life around and start to paddle toward the source, the living God who's the source of living water. And I'm just standing there going, dang, canoe guy is awesome. And I never, ever forgot that challenge for all of us to turn our canoe around and paddle upstream. Well, we're, we're starting a series today where Jesus uh, throws out some of the most countercultural turn your canoe around, paddle upstream words uh, that have ever been spoken. It's in, a, it's in a section of the Bible known as the Sermon on the Mount, and it is found in Matthew chapter 5. And we're just going to hang in the first section of that for a few weeks, a little section commonly known as the Beatitudes. Maybe you've heard of these before. Uh, it starts, let me just read the way it starts here in Matthew chapter 5, and then we'll kind of unpack some of them as an overview for where we'll be going for this entire series. It says, now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, hence the, the title, the Sermon on the Mount, and he sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. So he has all these, all these people around him that were looking to him for answers. And I think Jesus stands up in front of all these people. Anybody here chasing happy? Anybody here want to be happy? Because he uses the word for happiness, for, for approval, for a deeply satisfying life. The word that's used, you're going to see it over and over in these Beatitudes, is the word blessed. So Jesus says, if anybody, if you really want to be blessed, if you really want to be happy in your life, here are the steps to that. And I'm telling you, they are upstream against the flow kind of steps. Now, I've been teaching uh, these Beatitudes for a, a number of years in my life. In fact, one of the very first devotionals I ever wrote in my life as, a, as like a 21-year-old guy was, was a, a, about this because I just had in my mind uh, that, that Jesus was talking here in steps of progression. If you want to be happy, here's the first step. Here, here's the second step. Here's the third step. Here's the fourth step. And that doesn't always work like that. But I, and, and I may get to heaven someday and Jesus goes, you had that ladder thing, that step thing all, all wrong, bro. But, but I, just the way it's moved in my heart uh, through the years. Because I think Jesus, whenever he taught, he taught very purposefully. I don't think Jesus ever got up and just winged it. I don't think that Jesus, you know, got up in front of all these people that were in front of him on this mountainside and went, okay, so here's what I want to say. Uh, uh, man, I left my notes in the boat. Oh, uh, uh, blessed are the, uh, I don't think that Jesus was like that at all. I think this is a very purposeful progression that Jesus lays out. And maybe this will be helpful for you as we look at this overview for all these Beatitudes. And the way I've looked at it is like, they're kind of like, whoop, kind of like rungs on a, on a ladder here. This is just the way I have, I've looked at it in my life. And the very first rung on the ladder, Jesus begins this way. He says, if, if you're chasing happy, if you want to be happy, you want to be blessed, you want to have a deep level of soul, soul satisfaction, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
How's that for starters? Jesus said, listen, if, if, if you want to be happy in your life, the first thing you've got to realize is just how busted you are. You know, there's, there's different words for poor, destitute, destitute, broke, busted, impoverished, whatever words you, you can think of. But I think Jesus is talking here in spiritual terms, of course. I think he's saying, when, when you reach in your pockets and you pull them inside out and all you have are little lint balls in there, spiritually speaking, blessed are you. Because it's a good day when you realize your need for God. And I don't know about you guys, but I have, I've discovered in my life that the very first step to being happy in my life, the very first step to being fulfilled in my life was when I got to a point where I said, you know what, God, I'm busted. Compared to, compared to your holy standard, compared to, to you, I, I, I'm, I'm destitute. I am spiritually bankrupt. I need you so bad. And I don't know, I know a lot... Uh, a, lot, a lot of people that are, that are watching, a lot of people that come to mission and work through some 12-step stuff. And you know that this is the very foundational step to say, you know what? I just had to recognize, man, my life is unmanageable and I, and I need God. This is the first step, this step of surrender to say, you know what, God, I need you. I need you. And Jesus says, listen, blessed are those who reach in their pockets, their spiritual pockets, and turn them inside out and say, man, I am busted without God and I desperately need him. I think Jesus could have said it like this. Blessed are the broken. Blessed are those who say, you know what, enough. I need help. I need God in my life. That's where the first step of, of happiness in your life begins. Now, when I say, when I say blessed are the broken, uh, there's a difference between being broken and being miserable. And I've talked about this a lot before, how some people just get miserable and take that as, well, I'm really broken, and that's not necessarily broken. Broken has an element of humility attached to it. I was talking to a lady a, a while back who was telling me about her 23-year-old son who was deep into drug addiction and alcoholism and, and just m- making a mess of his life. And she looked at me, and she started crying. She goes, he's just so broken. And I just hugged her, and I said, ma'am, I just need to tell you something. Um, I'll pray for you and pray for your son, but you need to know he's not broken. He's just miserable because he continued to con her and use her and steal from her. And said, so there's a difference between being broken and being miserable. And when you've moved past the point of being miserable into the, into the reality of, man, I'm broken, I need help, I need God, that's the first step to happiness in your life. So Jesus begins that way. He says, listen, anybody chasing happy, you'll never be happy until you recognize your spiritual poverty, that you really need God in your life. Then he says this, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And then he says, blessed are those who mourn. Now this one's always kind of puzzled me, this blessed are those who mourn, because it sounds so, so, you know, counter, uh, contradictory to say, happy are you who mourn. And I think that Jesus was saying there's a day coming when those of you that, those of you that have heartbreak and you're, you're crushed in your soul, there's a day coming where you will be comforted once and for all. I think he was giving them hope. But I also think, again, if Jesus is laying this out in logical progression, I think he's saying blessed are those who mourn over the fact they've just discovered they're spiritually busted. I think that's the way this progression goes, is the first thing you do is recognize that you are broken before God, then it's got to move in your heart where you say, you know what, God, I'm ready to turn around. The Bible calls this repentance, making a, making a, a U-turn, making a, a 180 and say, you know what, God, I, I've been walking away from you, but now I recognize my need for you, and I'm going to turn my life away from the way I used to walk, and I'm going to start walking toward you. Jesus said, blessed are you when you get to that point, when you mourn over the fact that you are spiritually busted. So then he says this, he says, blessed are those who, what was the first one? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Mourn over what? The fact that they're poor in spirit. And then he says this, blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are the meek. Happy are those who are meek. Now, there's a little uh, misnomer about the word meek. Maybe you see the word meek, you think of weak or kind of wimpy or uh, uh, terms like that. But that's not what meek is means at all. In fact, in the Bible, the Greek word for meek literally meant to bridle wild horses. It was an equestrian term where, where it meant to, to get control of a, of a wild stallion. So again, if, this, if Jesus is laying this in logical progression, I think what he's saying, blessed are you who are spiritually busted and you recognize that. Then it moves in your heart and it breaks your heart and you say, God, I want forgiveness. I want to start turn my life around. I want to walk toward you. And when that happens, you say, you know what, God, I give up. I give up. I want to hand my life over to you. And I want to let you get my life under control. Blessed are the meek, those who will allow God to bridle your life. You know, I like to drive. I don't like to ride in a passenger seat. I like to be behind the wheel. And when my wife drives, she's a great driver, but I'd rather be in control, right? And I think Jesus is saying here, listen, blessed are you when you give up control. When you say, God, you know what? I'm, I'm sliding over. You take the reins, you take the wheel, 
I need you to be the leader of my life. Now, those first three steps on that ladder, they're laying out the steps of following Jesus with your life. In order to become a follower of Jesus, you got to do those first three things. You got to say, you know what, God, I need you. Secondly, say, I'm asking you for forgiveness. I, I'm, I mourn over my sin. I want to repent and turn toward you. And the third thing is, I'm laying down my, my rights and I'm surrendering my life and I want you to control my life. And Jesus says, man, if you do those things, gosh, happiness is going to start to flood in your life. And it's been so cool since mission started eight years ago to see so many people take those first three steps and say, I'm surrendering my life to the will and control of Jesus Christ. I want him to lead my life. You'll never be happy, truly happy without it, Jesus says. Then the fourth rung, fourth rung is this. He says, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after the right things of God, for they will be filled. He's saying, if you're looking for deep satisfaction, then you've got to hunger and thirst after the right things of God. Now, I think those first four rungs on the ladder, the, the, the uh, poor, poor in spirit, the blessed are those who mourn, uh, the blessed are the meek, and this fourth one, which says, you know, happy are you when you hunger and thirst after God. Those, all those four, four things are inward kind of things. Those are things that God wants to do on the inside of me and you. When we come to God and say, God, I'm humble, I'm broken, I'm repentant, I'm sorry, I'm surrendered, and I want to hunger after you. Those, when you do those four things, and those aren't just like a four things you do way back when you start to follow Jesus. Those are four things you do like every day of your life. You walk with a humble spirit, and you walk with a, uh, with a gratefulness toward the grace that you've been given, and you start to hunger after the things of God, and you, you get in his word, and you dig in like, like many of you have been doing through the Philippians study that, we, that we've been doing, where you, where you dig into God's word and apply it to your life. God says, you'll, you, you'll, you'll grow and you'll stretch and you'll be changed and you will be filled. Now, those first four things, like I said, are all inward things. And then the next four that go up the ladder, we're going to talk about each one of these each week. The next four you'll find are things that like come out of us after we do these these four things. If we're doing these four things, there are going to be some natural things that flow out of us. I think there is what I like to call like a preparation part of life and a presentation part of life. Now, let me, let me see if I can illustrate this at all. This is going to be a stupid illustration, I'm sure. But let's just say uh, my wife, Debbie, who's a phenomenal person, just a, I mean, I, I hit the jackpot when, I, when I, God led her into my life. And she loves to entertain and she loves to cook and loves to have people over. I mean, she's got a gift of hospitality. And if you've ever been to our home, you know, that's true. That's just the way, that's the way she is. And let's just say one day she, uh, she texts me and said, hey, uh, I'm, I'm fixing your favorite dinner. Now, when I was a little kid, this is a weird combination, but when I was a little, a little kid, I really loved this combination of sausage patties, corn on the cob, green beans, and fried green apples and cornbread. I just loved it, and a glass of sweet tea. I mean, I, just, I love, some, for some reason, my mom used to make it and just kind of got stuck in my heart, and I like that combination. Debbie texts me, says, I'm making that meal. I go, oh, I can't wait, can't wait to get home. And, 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 I, and I, get, I get home, and I'm, and I, and I, and I walk, in, walk inside the, the door, and, and she, she meets me there. And she's got like, uh, it smells really good when I walk in the door, but man, I walk in, and she's got like, you know, that green mask stuff on her face, and, and she's got like an a old T-shirt on, and she's, she's got a can of Diet Coke, and she belches and says, you're late. You know, I, whoa, I, I, walk in, I walk inside the door and, and, uh, and the, the house is an absolute, absolute wreck. And I mean, there's cans everywhere. There's, 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 you know, stuff that she's been chopping up. It's all over the place. It's just, the mixer got loose and it threw stuff around the kitchen. It is so gross in there. But uh, she worked really, really hard on this, on this meal. And, and she, she puts it on my plate. And it's like, oh my goodness, this meal is amazing. But it's so gross in here. I can't eat it. The preparation was amazing. The presentation <laughs> left a little to be desired. Now, on the other hand, say, say she meets me at the door and, and, and I walk in and, and she, she, she's got romantic music playing. There's like rose petals on the floor. She leads me over to, to the table, sets me down, begins to massage my shoulders. Now, this is all hypothetical. But then she, 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 she massages my shoulders. She got the table set with like china and crystal and you know, silverware, which she all borrowed from somebody and got it all on the table. And, and then she, but, I mean, it's, it's just spectacular in there. But what she saw, what she, what she did, she, 
She saw me coming down the road and she goes, oh no, I, I forgot. I forgot to put the dinner in. So she just throws it all in like a big pot and stirs it up and puts it in the microwave and nukes it a few minutes and plops it on my plate. And there it is. The sauces, the corn cob, the cornbread, the tea bag, the beans, everything just floating all there in one mess. The presentation was amazing. The preparation was a little lacking. And, and, and I know at least when I look back at my own life, man, I've, I've been lacking in both regards. And when I try to like, and I know a lot of people that say, you know what, I don't, need to, I don't need to do all these inside things, these preparation things. Just tell me what I need to do. Just give me some behavior modification steps and I'll just do those. It just doesn't work that way. It's just like you go through life kind of faking it. And other people I know, they just kind of hang right here and it never really affects the way they present themselves to a, to a world that so desperately needs the hope and the love and the good news of Jesus Christ. So preparation, those first four are essential and the next four are essential as well because preparation and presentation really, really matter. Now I want you to see the first thing that starts to come out of our life, after we do those things and walk with me as we go up the ladder again, Jesus starts with saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Then he says, blessed are those who mourn. Mourn over what? The fact that they're poor in spirit. Then he says, blessed are the meek. And that means to get, give your life over to the control and, uh, and care of Jesus Christ and let him lead your life. Then he says, blessed are you when you hunger and thirst after the right things of God. And then the first thing that comes out of you, it's this wrong right here. Just, just trust me, it's this wrong, this wrong right here. Is the first thing that comes out of your life, he says, blessed are the merciful. Isn't that cool? The very first thing that starts to come out of us in this presentation type of thing is the thing we just received from God. Blessed are you who are merciful. Now we talked last week a little bit about that word um, mercy. And we learned that the Greek word for mercy and compassion is that word spalakna. You remember that from last week? We talked about spalakna, that churning in your gut that won't let you rest until you do something for somebody else. Jesus said, happy are you when you got spalakna. When you realize you have received mercy from heaven, when you've received compassion from heaven, and now it stirs in your heart in such a way that you just have, you have to give it away to other people. You'll know in your life, you'll be blessed when you get to that point in your life, when you, when you live like that. I, I used to, like I said, do these summer camps and stuff. And a guy that I've done camps with before, way, way back in the day, was a great dude, great preacher. His name was Tommy Oaks, and he was from Tennessee. And, you know, I grew up in Kentucky, and I'm, I mean, I talk a little funny, but he talks really funny. I mean, he, he's, he's got a real hickey accent. And he would walk around, he's a great guy. He'd walk around camp and he'd do this all the time to kids. He'd walk up to kids and go, hey, 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 hey. I go, what, what is that? So I took him aside one and I said, Tommy, what, why do you do that to kids? Why are you always going like this? Hey, what, what, is, what does that mean? He goes, Mike, you know what that means? That means, that right there means God loves me. Now I love you. He'd go, hey, hey, hey. Blessed are you who recognize you have received mercy from God and now it just flows out of you to other people. So he says the second thing that starts to come out of you, blessed are you who are merciful, which is this rung right here. Then he says, blessed are you who are pure in heart. Now that doesn't mean that we will never have a bad thought or anything like that. It just means that, that blessed are you who are authentic is what he's saying here. Blessed are you who are real. You're not trying to play any cover-up games. You, you got no scam going on. You, you, you're playing no image management stuff because that, that just wears you out as a person. But when you're, when you're, when you're pure in heart, we're just going, what, what you see is what you get. There's a certain amount of freedom that comes with that. The, 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 the Latin word for uh, sincere uh, or, or genuine was the word sincera. Now, now that word came... Uh, out of the pottery world, not like not I'm talking about like pottery barn. I'm talking about you know back in the day when when, when there were you know, ancient potters and stuff, and and they would they would make these uh, porcelain uh, vases and statues and stuff. And uh, sometimes when they would fire them in the kiln, they would get little cracks in, in, in the porcelain. So dishonest merchants would take like pearly white wax and they would smear it in the cracks and pass it off then as the real deal. And then when a person would take their vase home or take their, you know, statue of Caesar home and it got out in the sun and the sun melted the wax, his nose would fall off. And so honest merchants started marking their wares with the tag sincera, which literally means without wax. Just saying what you see is what you get, cracks and all. Jesus goes, blessed are you when you live that kind of life. 
Blessed are you when you come to God and you come to other people and go, you know what, I, I'm not perfect. I got a lot of cracks and stuff, but hopefully those cracks are letting the light that's inside of me get out a little bit. Jesus said, blessed are you when you're pure in heart. And then he says, for they will see God. I've often thought when you're trying to wear a, a costume mask, kind of hard to see. Blessed are you when you're pure in heart. Then he says this, blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Then he says, blessed are you when you are a peacemaker. You know, it's cool these days to see people that are trying to champion peace and stand up for what's right. And, and the word peacemaker here, when Jesus says, when, when people see you being a peacemaker, he's not talking about people like, you know, separating fights. He's talking about people that are bringing, ushering in peace uh, into a situation. Uh, the, the word, what, what, what it reminds me of, it's like there's, there's two different kinds of people in the world. There are thermometers and thermostats. You know, what, what's a thermometer do? A thermometer shows you the temperature of the room, right? What's a thermostat do? It sets the temperature of the room. And I think Jesus is saying here, I think he's saying, bless are the thermostats. Those people that can walk into any kind of situation, no matter how tense it is, and when they show up, there's just a sense of peace and rightness and joy that comes from them. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for when you live a life like that, people will look at you and go, they must, they must be children of God. Now, let's, let's review real quick as we, as we go back up the ladder. The first wrong, Jesus says, if you're going to be happy, blessed are the poor in spirit. You're right. Blessed are those who are spiritually busted. They, they know they need God. Then he says, blessed are those who mourn. Mourn over what? The fact they've just discovered that they're poor in spirit, busted before God and broken. Then he says, blessed are the meek. That means just let, letting your life, giving your life over to the care and control of Jesus Christ and letting him lead your life. And then you start to hunger and thirst after God and you're filled with all the good things of life when you do that. And then he says, the first thing that comes out of you after you do all these type of things, as you do these daily, as you humble yourself and you surrender yourself, that then you become this merciful person that just flows out of you. Blessed are you who are merciful. And then he says, blessed are the the, the, the pure in heart, the people that are just sincere, and I'm not going any further. The next one says, blessed are the peacemakers. And then you get all the way to the top of this ladder, all the way to the top, the very top rung. Jesus says this, blessed are those who are persecuted. Jesus, I thought you were talking about happiness. You, you, you're kidding me, right? Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're... you're you're telling me I turned my life around, I started going upstream, and, and, I, and I started walking toward you, and I, and, I, and, I, and I recognized I needed you, and I mourned over the fact, and I repented, and I turned toward you, and I gave you the control of my life, and I started to hunger after you, and then I started being merciful, I was pure in heart, I was just trying to be what you see is what you get, and I've been trying to be a peacemaker. You're telling me at the top rung of this is persecution? Come on, Jesus, I'm not sure I signed up for that kind of happy. You know, uh, here's what I think about that. I think when people see all these things in your life, they see Christ's likeness in your life, they don't quite know what to do with you. They didn't know what to do with Jesus. And sometimes that can mean being rejected. Sometimes it can mean being left out, being ridiculed, being scoffed at, and even being persecuted. Many of the people that were standing there in the presence of Jesus that day, who decided to follow him, many of them would die through persecution from the Roman Empire. And so Jesus was kind of giving them a heads up, listen, when people see all these things in you, when they see Christ's likeness in you, they might not know what to do with you. One of the, one of the cool honors, unexpected honors of my life, I was getting ready to preach one weekend, and I was backstage, and like getting a microphone on, that kind of stuff, and somebody said, hey, you've got a guest here who wants to, wants to meet you and pray with you. And we had just uh, done like a fundraising thing to, to deliver all these uh, Bibles to the underground church in, in China. Because people literally had to go underground uh, to, to meet as, as Jesus followers. And they said, uh, this is not his name, but they call him Peter. And he is the, one of the founders of the underground church in China. And he would like to come backstage and pray with you. They were visiting the United States to thank people for what they've been helping them do. He had another guy with him. They said his name was Barnabas. That wasn't his real name either. But uh, so uh, Peter comes backstage to pray with me. And he didn't speak English. But it was such an honor to meet him. A guy that had risked his life many times over 
to spread the good news of Jesus Christ in a communist country as China was and is. Uh, but I couldn't help but notice as he stood there with me that several of his fingers were all crooked and bent because they had been broken many times uh, through police officers, people there that, you know, the work for the government that uh, forbid him to, to preach and teach the name of Jesus. He had cigarette burns up and down both arms. It was just like, oh my goodness. And uh, they asked if he could pray with me and he prayed with me and he put his arm around me, he began to pray and he, he prayed in Mandarin. I didn't understand a word he said, but gang, I understood every word he said. I just knew this was a guy who said, you know what, I, I want to live like this. And if I get to the top and people don't know what to do with me and they persecute me, it's okay because Jesus told me, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. I can remember that day when I, when I went out to preach, I thought, man, if this guy can do it, I can certainly do it today. And it filled me with so much courage. I don't know where you're at on, on this ladder. You know, you, you maybe, maybe right now you're receiving some persecution, some rejection, some some. some standoffishness or, or worse because of you, you following Jesus. Jesus, that's, it's okay. Rejoice and be glad because someday it's all going to be, it's all going to be well. Or, or maybe you're not even really kind of starting your journey and maybe, maybe it's time for you to say, you know what? I, I really need to recognize my need for God. To be honest, I've never really reached in my spiritual pockets and seen what was in there and recognized that I'm busted. I mean, maybe I need to start there. Maybe that's you today. Just say, you know what? I, I want to start this journey with God. Or maybe, maybe you've kind of done that, but it's kind of been a fleeting thing and it's never really moved you to action. You never really have let it stir in your heart and move you toward turning your life toward God and saying, God, I want you to take the wheel of my life and drive my life. Or, or maybe, maybe you're, kind of, you're, you're kind of stuck on the first three and you never got to the fourth one where you really started to get into God's word and started to grow and hunger and thirst after the right things of God. I just challenge you, wherever you're at, just take the next step. Just take the next step. I mean, maybe, maybe during these difficult times in our country right now, you can say, you know what? I'm going to be a person that just goes around expressing the mercy of God that I have received. I'm going to be pure in heart. I'm going to be a peacemaker. I'm going to be a thermostat that changes the, the environment, any environment I go into. I just, which, which rung are you on? I'll just ask you just to pray. And, and, and as we go through this series together, and we're going to break each one of these down each week that you would just kind of say, okay, God, move me on. Move me on to a, to a deeper walk with you and another step of growth so that my life can go upstream against the flow toward the source of living water. Let's pray together. Father, grateful for this series that we're launching into, and I thank you, Jesus, for these countercultural words. Thank you for the challenge they have been in my life. Thank you for the clarity they've been in my life. Uh, I thank you... Um, for the countless people that, that, that are out there chasing happy, that maybe these words would recenter them and go, oh, so that's what happiness means. That's where you find true, deep satisfaction. That's where you, you can look at your life and go, I'm so blessed. Father, I pray that you would grow us up every week as we walk through these beatitudes. I pray, Jesus, that your words would penetrate deep into our spirit and that the Holy Spirit would do something amazing in our life and in our church, and as a result, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our community, in our state, in our country, in our world, through us. And I pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.